But Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit had just poured out. And then Peter had stood up and he's talking. And then he quotes the prophet Joel and he says, speaking of a time such as this that we are in now. He says that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit. And just as I say that, I feel like I need to remind you that God doesn't just drip. Like with the medicine dropper. Or he, he, he's not just, 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 just distributing apportionately, but he pours out. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. It says your sons and daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I want to ask you, young men, are you seeing visions? Old men, are you prophesying? Because such a time as this, that the Spirit of God has been poured out and revival is in the air. We may be socially distant, but we're together and we're closer than ever before. In verse 18, he says, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And they will prophesy, I will show wonders in the heavens above and on the earth below. Blood and billows of smoke and the sun will be tuned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great day of the glorious great day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And team, you might as well just stay with me. We'll just work through this. This week, the... The Lord was speaking to me, and as I just described, I probably should stand in an allocated spot. But the Lord was speaking to me about, in, in the last two weeks, I've just been on this journey of, uh, of even like I kind of articulated just before this, this knowing, and there's, it's, it's, I, I, I describe it like there's this, this, this part of my heart that's going, God, I want more of you. God, I just want more of your presence. God, I want more of your presence. And I know that it's there. And I know that it's crying out and I know it's saying I want more, but louder are the voices of everything else around me that says do this and do that and do this and go here and be here and, and, and don't even just do that, play Xbox or, or, or do this or, or just be lazy or eat this. And, and, and although I know that little small voice is there that's just leaning me towards whether it's the Word of God or putting on some worship or calling someone or encouraging someone or maybe prophesying or or writing down, going back to the visions as I alluded to last week. I felt like the Lord was saying over the next couple of weeks, He wants to take us on a journey of getting back to a place because a lot of us have almost got like a little porthole of porthole, portal of heaven that we're like, we're like, yeah, we're tapping in, we're good. But you know that he wants to pour out all on you, that you, He wants to drench it. From us to Him, there's this, yeah, I, I, I just want it, but there's just so much going on in life. It's like we just only have a little bit of room for God. See, when we come around this concept of revival is in the air, it's speaking of a notion that is not just about when we have time for Him, but He's made all the time in the world for us. In fact, He made the world for us so that we could have time, that we could have intimacy and that we could have a relationship. It's not necessarily just about a worship moment like this. Jesus said to the lady in Samaria as He was there beside the well as she was getting her water in the middle of the day, she was ashamed, she was embarrassed, she felt separated and different to everyone else. But Jesus being the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, he always turns up at the right time. He turned up and he met her at her deepest hour of need. I'm sure there was something deep within there because she knew scripture. She knew where, where, where the Jews should worship and where the, 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 the Samaritans should worship. She knew it. But it was like in that moment, God met her the little bit that she desired with the fullness of the Son, Jesus. And I have this picture of her running away from a conversation as he just prophesied and gave her words of knowledge about her life. Even as I say that, I feel like I'm speaking to someone that God's reminding you of times that you've had divine specific encounters. Encounter, encounter, encounter. I just prophesy encounters over living rooms right now. I prophesied over your couch. 
Some people, you are actually feeling weird about feeling the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in your house. If you can't feel it in your house, don't worry about just sensing it at church. If the joy of the Lord is busting out, why don't you put a, a, a smiley face icon? If you, the, 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 the Spirit of God's touching you, why don't you say something? In the feed there. But I had this point this week, and I'll stop yelling at you. My little boy, he's seven now, and they have this fun run at school, and because of corona, apparently parents aren't allowed to go. My wife says it's because I'm ADHD that she told me three times that when I called her and I was in the car park, and I said, where are all the other parents? She said, I told you three times you weren't meant to be there. So I drove out of the car park and parked on the road, and a little bit of the naughtiness came out and I got out and then saw Mrs. Ross, our worship pastor, who was apparently just going for a lazy walk. And we were all there to cheer on our sons, but they did prep and they did prep H and prep C. And then all of a sudden I get this text on my phone and Chrissy, my wife, she said, look out for Hunter. He's got the blue socks on. And for some wee reason, probably it's a Nugent thing. I think he wears these long sock, blue soccer socks all the time. And, 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 then, and then they say go and it was online. And, and I don't think he thought I was there. I think he thought I was watching. But as they started to round the first corner, I saw this like little head come up and there was a locking of eyes. And as he went under the parachute and then he climbed over this funny looking obstacle. For me, I was sitting there thinking, go around it, just keep running, skip it, don't go down. Go. But he was doing everything properly like his mother would do <laughs> and then when he got close because the night before I said Hunter we got to strategize this if you just run as fast as you can you'll win for three quarters of that race but then someone will overtake you remember that this is an endurance race that this is this you you, you gotta you gotta pace yourself but as Hunter came and he looked and he saw her and he waved I said, Hunter, wait for the sprinklers, wait for the sprinklers, wait for the sprinklers, because they turned on the sprinklers, wise thing to do in winter for kids. But when he got to the sprint sprinklers, he starts running faster, and then I heard him slow down, and then I heard Mrs. Ross, as she was further down the road, go, run faster, Hunter, run faster, Hunter. He didn't win, he came third, but he won, or won, in my eyes. And see, here's the thing. There was a point of connection. There was a point of father and son, of interaction, of just seeing and knowing that dad was there, that, 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 that the son was there. And I feel like God is enticing us into a season that we would know that he is there, that he is cheering us, that we're not doing this alone, that when s systems and when procedures and when obstacles would say, hey, God's not here, God shouldn't be in this, God's not in this. I want you to know, and I feel like I'm declaring it over someone this morning, that God is there and he is saying, lock eyes with me son run pace yourself you've got this that I'm here with you that I'm moving forward with you the Bible says and speaks in the the book of Joshua talks about Joshua in the very first passage of the scripture of Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 the first time we actually hear about Joshua the reference to Joshua will be uh, that Joshua was, I'm trying to recall it, the aid to Moses, that he was an armor bearer, and the Lord said to him, then he had passed. See, Joshua's first reference in the Bible in the context of coming into his own uh, as a son, as, as someone that's now standing, talking one-on-one, -on -one, face to face with God, that's been articulated in the Word of God. Joshua chapter 1 says that he was an aid to Moses. But then in verse 2, it starts to talk about the promise that is upon his life. He graduated and transitioned from, from this moment of, of aid, of carer, of armor bearer, of servant. And I feel like God wants some people to know this morning that you are not just an aid to pastor. You are not just an aid to this or an aid to that or an armor bearer to this. Yes, there is a time and a mandate and a place for that. But God is saying this morning that you are a son, that you are a daughter, that you have been chosen. And I still hear him saying, lock eyes with me. God gave Joshua a couple of instructions. 
but to really understand Joshua's journey into this point of being. You need to understand Joshua's journey. There's three significant points. Oh, Holy Spirit, just lead me right now. Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. All of you, God. You know, when Moses met with Joshua, Moses was unworthy. Sorry, God. He was wandering around the wilderness and it was a fire burning. But little did Moses know that revival was about to hit his life. The fact that he saw the fire was one thing, but the decision to walk towards the fire was the beginning of the moment of revival, of a shifting and a changing. Literally, he knew that that would affect the very ground that we're standing on today, the foundation, the Word of God that we're reading right now. He had no comprehension of that. He just made a decision to walk towards the eyes of the Lord. Moses, after a lot of persuasion and conversation, becomes obedient, goes in, and as we know, he rescues, he leads Israel, God's chosen people out of Egypt. And then we hear about Joshua, really, for the first time in Exodus, where Joshua led the army of Israel against the Amalekites, and they overthrew them and they defeated them. There's another time that we hear about this young man, Joshua, who comes into his own. The Bible says that when they were camped out uh, on the side of Sinai and, and Joshua and Moses went up towards the mountain, Joshua stayed halfway and Moses went to the top, that on the ground, the people, they got tired and they got weary and they decided they need, needed something physical to hold on to. They'd seen the miracles. They had that little bit of a portal, probably desire for more of God. They knew that God was on the mountain with Moses, but they decided they would just, they would just f fill time, I guess, with, with building an idol to worship. But Joshua wasn't involved in that. He was separate to that. And the Bible tells us one of the most significant times, I think, for Joshua and the Bible, apart from the whole book of Joshua, is Exodus 33, 11, where we read and we hear that Moses would go out into this tent, this tabernacle, this place that God designated as a place of meeting, of encounter, of presence. And Joshua being Moses' aide, his armor bearer, his assistant, he was privy to be able to go into that place. And I believe up until this point, Joshua hadn't yet fully experienced what it is to look eye to eye with the presence of God. He knew the smell, he knew the fragrance, he knew the touch. He, he, he started to develop, I believe, the desire to get into the presence of God. Because the Bible says that when Moses would leave, that Joshua would stay in the presence of God. It's an interesting notion because Joshua goes through a discipleship lesson and what it is to go through seasons of being close to the presence of God, but then being distant to the presence of God. And I love that the book of Numbers, so far back from the New Testament, so far back from the scripture that I read right at the beginning, actually starts to depict God's master plan that he always had, that we would be together, that we would be connected that we would walk united, that we would be able to ha see his, his eyes, see, smell his fragrance, touch his face, and just be close to him. The Bible says this, in fact, the people of God in Numbers chapter 11, they've been rebellious against God. They've been complaining the whole way. And every time they complain like a good, good father that he is, he provided for them. And he started to get a little bit fed up. And then Moses himself, he started to get a little bit fed up. He started to say, God, these people, and you told me to do this for them. Remember Joshua, the young aide, he's in the background. 
there's a significant point that Joshua, excuse me, Moses says this to God. God says to him in verse 11, sorry, chapter, verse 10 of chapter 11. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. He's asking the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? Why have you, what have I done to displease you? What's the burden that you have brought on me in verse 12? Did I conceive these people? Did I give birth to them? Did I tell them? Or did I carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land promised to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. And then he says this in verse 14, I found it profound and significant for what we've been talking about this morning. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. But what do we know about the New Testament? What have we been prophesying? What have we been singing? Not just to, tonight, friend, or this morning, but what have we been talking about all week? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. And you know, even as I jump forward to verse, verse 16, the Lord responded to Moses and he said this. He said, bring 70, bring the 70 Israel elders who were known to you as the leaders and officials out from among the people and have them come to the tent of meeting. And there they will stand with you. In verse 17, he said this, I will come down and I will speak to you there. And I will take some of the power. Another translation says, I will take the spirit, the Holy Spirit that is upon you and I will put it on them. And they will share the burden of the people so they will not have to carry it alone. God always had a master plan that we would walk carrying the power, the dunamis, the anointing, not just carry it upon us, but have it rest in us. The Old Testament was all about having it rest upon for a time. But the New Testament, the blood of Jesus, the brokenness of his body was all about carrying it and walking one with him as a whole being and as a whole person. feel like I need to tell someone this morning that if you feel like you've lost heart, if you feel like you're carrying a load, yet you know God is there and God is willing to do it, that this word is for you this morning that he wants to declare over you that he's willing and that all you have to do is turn your eyes back towards him. Because like a good, good father, regardless of restrictions, regardless of rules, regardless of medication, regardless of mental health, regardless of diagnosis or prognosis, he is a God that can, cannot be contained. I love what Graham, uh, Graham Cook said. He said, God is not logical and he is not rational. If he was rational or a rational God, how would he ask us to believe in something that we cannot see? And if he was a logical God, how would he ask us or why would we need faith? He says to us, faith is the evidence, the evidence, the proof of what you're believing for, but stepping out on what you can't see. See, right now you can't see your breakthrough, but I want to tell you he's right there looking at you. He's right there calling you in. I know time's getting away for us, so I'm going to finish. Joshua, the young aide, learns this lesson. And he watches, and later Moses goes and he calls the, the elders out. And as the Spirit of God falls on them, it says in verse 26, Verse 24, so Moses went out and he told the people all that the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of the elders and he had them stand around the tent. The Lord came down in the cloud and he spoke to him and he took some of the power. He took the Holy Spirit and he put it on him and some of the other elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. When was the last time you had visions? When was the last time you prophesied? Because the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit falls, that it would be poured out, that we would prophesy, that we would dream dreams, that signs and wonders would come, that miraculous would happen, which will be part two and part three over the next couple of weeks. 
But then he says this, and remember Joshua's looking from a distance. These men are out and they're getting touched. They're having a Holy Ghost soak meeting and probably got some catches. And in verse 27, it says, A young man ran and told Moses, Elad and Medad, those dudes are prophesying back in the camp. Like they ain't even out near the tent of meeting in the glory cloud, but the Spirit of God is there. And then it says in verse 28, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been with Moses or Moses' aid since he was a youth, spoke up and he said to Moses, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But the wisdom of someone who had actually been in the presence of God turned around to the young man. And he said, Joshua, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all of the Lord's people were prophets. And I wish that all of the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. You know, in that moment, as I read that this week, I felt the Lord take us down this train. I want to remind you that it's not the pastor, it's not just the prophet, not just the evangelist, not just the people that sit in the front rows of your churches, whether you're watching from Brazil to Antarctica, that the Spirit of God wants to work through you, He wants to work with you, He wants to be intimate with you, whether it's just for you or for this planet, He wants to be in partnership with you. In verse 29, what Moses emphasizes is salvation. The emphasis is the importance of knowing the presence of God, not just being uh, rational and not just being logical, but actually having the ability to step into the spiritual and say, God, even though I want to play Xbox, even though I want to do my work, I'm just going to stop and for five minutes today, I'm just going to pray in the spirit. I'm just going to open up my Bible and I'm going to read a scripture and I'm going to declare uh, uh, today is a good day and I'm enjoying my life. I'm just going to start to speak some positivity, God. I'm just going to actually just, 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 just say that I know that you're with me. Whatever it takes for you to be able to look and to see and know that dad's there looking in. The best part about this is, and I found this time and time and time again, even for myself as a young man, that even if it wasn't the coronavirus and if there were thousands of parents on that field at this particular school, that when my son came through the line, that he would find my eyes. His first port of call would not be his principal, not the icy pole they were giving out, not the ribbon that was awaiting him, but he'd be looking for his dad and he'd be looking for him and he'd be, he'd be looking for him, waiting for that thumbs up. And sometimes even now we don't do a thumbs up, we just do because we're like too cool now. It's just like, I want to tell you, friend, you have a dad, a father in heaven who wants to embrace you so bad. And his master plan, as we just read in verse 29, as Moses said to Joshua, Joshua, it's not about honor for me and individuality for me in the presence of God. My desire, and I know what God's desire is, that the Spirit of God would fall and rest on everyone. And at that particular point, that would be a corporate revival. But individuals are okay for now. So I want to speak to one other group of people. See, I believe sometimes we can become so sensitive to the presence of God that we actually become religious. And when other people aren't, when other people are doing things in a different way, in a different mannerism, that maybe they don't fit the box and vice versa. If you're someone that's very analytical and very theological, which is great, I love it. We need it. That's my wife. I'm the opposite. I'm all over the shop. But it's not about how we are. It's about how we're together. And we're together through Jesus. And this is all about Jesus. And God knew, I believe, even at this particular point in time, just as Moses did, just as Joshua learned, just as the other 72 elders learned at this particular point in time, that it would take more than just a mere human being born to a mother and a father. Flesh and blood, normality of this world to be able to bring a revival such as what we're talking about. 
So God, probably knowing all things from the beginning to the end, in fact, knowing all things to the beginning and the end, He sent His only Son. The only way for everyone, not just the 72, including Joshua and some randoms in the side of the camp to experience the presence of God was for Jesus to come. Friend, today the Bible tells us, and I'm just going to be real quick, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Lord God is defined as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our language, which we can help educate you with, is the Trinity. It's a triune God, three in one. The Bible tells us in the Scriptures, Paul says in Romans, we don't follow Paul, we follow Jesus. But Paul said this, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when Paul closed his letter to the church of Corinth, probably in the same way that he would close this meeting today, he said this, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. See, when you make a decision to call on the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, in that moment, He comes to be with you. Not just rest upon you like I've just read, but He actually comes in the person of the Holy Spirit, he makes his home within you. And he starts to wash you clean. And your past and your future is forgiven. And what that does is it enables us to walk back into right relationship. It doesn't disqualify us and mean that we're separated any longer. But we actually become part of the family of God. The Holy Spirit has been moving since... Genesis chapter 1. He's always, even right now, in your living room, in your lounge room, in your office, in your car, wherever you're at, He's moving. The Bible says that in the beginning, the earth was without void. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, hovered over the earth. The Holy Spirit's interpretation of the earth was, was that it needed formation, that it needed beauty, that it needed creativity, that it needed rivers and streams. And when you invite Jesus into your heart and into your life, friend, He transforms it and takes it from what was once upon a time a broken vessel. And He'll walk with you in relationship like a good, good father, closer than the air that you breathe, and He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And even at times where you feel like he's so far away, he's so close. The Bible says in Romans that if we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, and that if we confess with our mouth, then we will be saved. So I want to pray a real simple prayer with you. If you're with me now and that's you, you're saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I know I've done some things wrong and I've never invited him into my heart. This doesn't mean you have to join a club, sign up, get emails, all that stuff. This is between you and God, but I want to lead you in a prayer. So this morning, if you're praying this with me right now, dear Jesus, this morning, I choose to believe in you. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you came into this earth, that you were sinless and perfect in every way, that you hung on the cross that your body was broken and that at the shedding of your blood, it paid the price for all of my sins. I acknowledge that I have been a sinner. And from this moment forward, I thank you for your forgiveness for all of my sins. And I choose right now to forgive myself for all the things I've done wrong. Father, I thank you for your grace that wraps around me as I move forward. As I turn off this stream and I move into my Monday, my Tuesday, my Wednesday, my Thursday. Jesus, today I pray that you would fill me with this Holy Spirit that I've heard about. And right now I thank you that revival, rejuvenation, life is once again filling my my mortal body in the form of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friend, we've gone... 10 minutes over. I know there's another community that are coming in. But if you did pray that prayer, I want to encourage you just below 
on, on the stream or you can jump onto where, whatever location you are, whatever, I was going to say whatever planet you're on. I feel like I'm on a different planet right now. Whatever planet, wherever you are in the, in the earth, jump onto a local church. There'll be a link there. There'll be a pastor there. There'll be someone that will come and meet with you. Remember, this isn't just about joining a club or becoming part of a religious organization. This is about walking in an intimate relationship with the creator of heaven and earth that always had a master plan that you would walk with him in unity and purpose. I can't wait for next week, friend, for all of our family to talk about why John chapter 16. And then the week after that, he's, I love it. I'm getting excited talking about the gifts of the Spirit the fruit of the Spirit, because revival's in the air, friend. Hey, for all of our family, all of our friends, we've already got some chairs laid out. I know the rules are changing daily and weekly, but we're making plans that we'll be back here the, uh, the second week of July, I think it's July the 12th, uh, that we'd be back. Um, we're planning however many services we need to do to be able to cater for everyone. Um, we'll let you know all the details. That changes regularly, so we don't want to put too much out now, but know that we are so eagerly anticipating uh, being able to be back together again. Remember, if we can pastorally do anything for you um, and we haven't contacted you, please reach out to us at Presence Church. We love you. Thank you for staying, for streaming. Um, as they say on my son's YouTube channels, like and subscribe. It does good things for the church, apparently. I don't know how that stuff works, but God bless you and have an amazing week. Father, right now, I thank you that your anointing has just freshly swept through every household. Lord, I pray that you would rest, Lord Jesus, on people as they have lunch. Lord, that they would prophesy, that they would have dreams again tonight. And then once again, Lord, I thank you that your blood has made a way, God. And it's not even just about your blood, but you rose again, Lord. And I thank you that revival is in the air in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you, friend. We pray that you've been blessed by our live stream today. Remember to sign up for our email newsletter and to follow us on our Facebook and our Instagram. We hope to see you again next week at our live stream.